Okay, hey guys, my name is Mithun, and today I'm going to be talking about the Web Audio API, a native JavaScript library. And specifically, we're going to look at how we can use this API to do both audio synthesis and audio analysis, which is going to be applied to actually visualizing how sound waves look and how frequency is affected when sound waves are modulated. So, before we get into that, just a really brief uh, history of audio in the web browser. So, um, some of the earliest technologies for that were the BG sound tag used in Internet Explorer and the embed tag in Netscape. These allowed sites to trigger just some background sound file to play when you loaded a page. But they were limited to just those browsers, and you really didn't have much control over the playback anyway. Adobe Flash was the first cross-browser way of, doing, of playing audio, but it required a plug-in, so you have to download something. Um, more recently, HTML5 has introduced this audio element, which is really great. You guys might remember it from when we did the Juke workshop. And it's native to JavaScript and works with all browsers. So why do you need this web audio API thing? Why not just use the audio tag? Well, if all you want to do is play audio and pause it and stop it and play like song samples, uh, pre-recorded sounds, then you should just use the audio tag. Um, it's really simple. You can set an audio source in your HTML, select it in JavaScript, call play, stop, pause functions. But if you're making an app that requires more precise or intensive audio applications, like a game, or some kind of music app, um, then the audio tag has lots of limitations, and it's not going to let you do all the things that you're going to need to do. So some of the limitations of this tag, um, there's no precise timing. So for example, if, you're, if you made like a shooting game, and someone shot at you, and you heard the sound of the bullet a second after it was actually fired, well, you'd be dead, and also your game would suck, because <laughs> you need those sound effects to be really precise for a lot of games, especially action games, right? And you also need to be able to play lots of different samples at once, because there are all these different things going on in an environment. And if your browser starts to slow down because you're playing too many things, or it sets a cap, it's no good. Also, with the audio tag, you can play back sound files, but you can't actually dynamically create sound files um, or sounds. So there's no audio synthesis, and there are no real-time effects. And another thing, there's no way to analyze your sound data and then use that to create visualizations. So all these limitations are things that the Web Audio API has overcome. And so it's a native JavaScript library, like I said, and it gives developers in your browser access to features that are usually found just in specialized applications, so like digital audio workstations, like Logic and Ableton, and game audio engines. Um, and some of those features are, well, the two we're going to talk about today are synthesis and analysis. So synthesis is actually like generating sounds. And you can use that to build instruments. I'm going to show you a little uh, synth app demo that I made in a little bit. Um, and then analysis really involves looking at taking data from the sounds that are being played, looking at data related to their time and the frequencies being played. And you can do all kinds of uh, applications with that. Um, speech recognition is one, pitch and rhythm detection another. And the one we're going to be looking at today is just a, a graphic visualization. Um, and lastly, something that we're not going to look at a demo of, but you can also simulate spatialization. So Web Audio API can handle like um, simulating stereo sounds. So if you want, if you have a, a game where you need, you know, something, a sound effect to sound like it's coming from a certain distance, certain direction, you can do all of that with this API. So how does it work? Well, it's all native, right? So you don't have to require anything. And all you have to do is create a new instance of something called the audio context, which is just a property of the window object. And everything in the Web Audio API happens inside of this audio context. So I think the best way to visualize it is as a flowchart. It's really like 
a flow chart within which you can make lots of different nodes and connect those together. And at the bottom here, this diagram is the most basic like working audio context you could have, where you have a source, a sound source. In this case, it's just an oscillator. And it's going to a destination, which is your laptop speakers. But this is just the most simple implementation. You can have as, really as many nodes as your computer can handle. Um, so I can make this oscillator node and then connect it to, to an effect, like a filter, or reverb, or delay, or a phaser, or something, and then have that go through some sort of volume control, and have that go through an analyzer, and just set it up however I want, depending on what I want to create. And it just eventually has to also connect to a destination. So before we jump into that, some of you guys might be like, what, what's an oscillator? What's a filter? What are you talking about? I don't know this music stuff. So just a brief overview of synthesis and some of the terms that we're going to be looking at. Um, so I think the best way to understand how synthesizers work, think about these three main parts, oscillators, filters, and amplifiers. So the oscillator is the thing that's actually creating the sound. And it's basically generating a waveform at a certain pitch. Um, and higher sounds have a higher pitch and a higher, which is measured in hertz. So the human ear can hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So if someone played back a tone at like 12,000 hertz really loud, that would be ear piercing, really uncomfortable. If they played something at 100 hertz, it would be a pretty low bass sound. Um, and if you look at this, this graph on the bottom left, that's a visualization of a sine wave. And the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is amplitude. Amplitude is really the intensity of the wave. It's not the same as volume, but for our purposes, you can think of it essentially as volume. Um, so a sine wave has very smooth uh, curves, because the amplitude just moves very gradually, very smoothly. Um, so that's one wave shape. There's also triangle waves, square waves, sawtooth waves. And if you look sort of at that diagram on the bottom right, so notice these top two uh, pictures right here. So imagine that the x-axis represents the same amount of time in both of those, so like two seconds or something. So for the low frequency, notice how you only see two full wavelengths there. But for the high frequency, there are a lot more. That's because with a low frequency, the wave is actually vibrating much slower. So over the same period of time, it's going to complete its wavelength much fewer times. Um, and then if you look at the bottom of that diagram, a quieter sound has lower amplitude than a louder sound. So those peaks and troughs are going to be different depending on volume. Um, so then a lot of the times an oscillator runs through a filter. And a filter is something that just shapes the tone of the sound by attenuating frequencies. Attenuating is a fancy word for just reducing. So you'd set a cutoff. Let's say you have a filter called a low pass filter. What this does is that it passes through low frequencies and attenuates high frequencies at a certain point. So you set that point with the cutoff. Let's say you set it to 1,000 hertz. Then when you're playing back the sound, every frequency from 1,000 hertz up is going to be reduced, and the sound is going to sound a lot different. You guys are going to see this visualized in just a second. Lastly, the amplifier is just what controls the volume, um, how much goes to the output. So before we go and look at the app, I want to show you the audio context for the app that I just built. So starting from the left, there are actually 12 oscillators here. And that's because I built a keyboard that plays 12 different notes. And you might be like, why did you make 12 different sound sources if it's one instrument? Well, I did that because I wanted um, each note to be independent, and I wanted to give the user the ability to play multiple notes at once. So they're not stepping on each other. So each key has its own oscillator, and that's going to its own gain node. But all of those are then being routed through the same filter, which you're going to see soon. Then that passes through the analyzer, which is what we're going to use for data visualization, and finally to your speakers. So. Let's see this thing in action. Just reload it really quick. And right now, it is set up. Oh, let me see if I can make this bigger. 
So right now, I think it's going to play a triangle wave. You can play multiple notes at once. That's really distorted. Uh, let's try a sine wave. A square wave is going to sound a bit harsher. That's really harsh. So notice how all these different wave shapes have slightly different sonic characteristics. Um, now, let's actually visualize what these waves look like. So when I press this filter button, it's not only going to connect all of my oscillators to the filter, it's also going to connect them to the analyzer. So I turn this on, and on the bottom left, well, let's just see it in action. So, so So what's happening here is that this filter right here, this slider that I'm changing right here is changing the cutoff frequency. So if I have it like pretty far to the right and I play a sound, Oh, that's not a good example. So, so this bottom right, bottom left uh, diagram is showing basically the x-axis is frequency. So on the left, you have low frequencies. On the right, you have high frequencies. And notice how when the filter is all the way to the left, so the cutoff is at a really high point, but if I move that filter over to the left, attenuated, so they're not really playing anymore. You'd also be able to hear it if these speakers were better. Um, and to the right, I actually have a visualization of the waveforms being played. So let me play a sine wave. And if I attenuate it so that only the lowest notes are playing, it's going to vibrate slower. So notice how it's vibrating. It's still vibrating pretty quickly, but if I were to then allow more high frequencies to come through, it's starting to vibrate. So there's also this, which loads the sample. Okay. I'm not a keyboard player. Sorry, guys. Um, and really quickly, I want to talk to you guys about how sort of the graphic visualization is happening. And for that, let me find uh, this code. So basically what's happening is that um, we are using an HTML canvas element, and we're dynamically telling the page to render data um, and we remember that we hooked up our signal chain to an analyzer node. So that analyzer node um, takes basically an array and fills it with values based on either the frequency or the time as the sound is being played, and constantly re-renders. Um, so what, let me get back to these slides. Okay, so. It uses something called a fast Fourier transformation, which is a complex algorithm, not going to get really into. But basically, you can either get time domain data, which is what I used for the waveform, or frequency data, which is what I used for the, the red EQ uh, graphic. So in conclusion, Web Audio API, it lets you do advanced audio tasks in the browser, like synthesis, analysis. And you can combine this with visualization tools. I just use a Canvas element but you can really use any visualization library that you want and do all sorts of crazy things. Um, and there are other audio libraries that really build off of the Web Audio API, and they make a lot of like instrument creation and all that stuff easier. Like Tone.js is a good one, but they're rooted in the same logic. So that is my presentation. Thank you guys for listening.